Institute for Faith and Freedom at Grove City College presents Liberty Mail with the Student Fellows of Faith and Freedom. Welcome to Liberty Mail with Aaron Jenks and Grace Riley. And we are in the underground studio here at Grove City College, sponsored by the Institute for Faith and Freedom. So we're back with episode three and uh, continuing uh, the momentum of big ideas in politics and culture. We wanted to hit on what's definitely been in the news a lot over the past couple of years and uh, increasing in kind of just your small talks at the table, I think, or just amongst friends at college is Marxism or this idea of uh, communism, socialism, uh, progressive ideology coming into specifically education and all aspects of life, really. And so we wanted to start off by let's hit down uh, who Marx was and kind of how this has, we believe that how it has drawn a clear line from Marx and his work as a theorist to 21st century uh, USA. Yeah, absolutely. And in the education system today, there's a lot of this talk because a lot of the public education system, whether that be from elementary school now up to universities, does have a left leaning that has some Marxist ties to it. And I think talking about Marx and what that means, like, first of all, there's a lot of misconceptions between what socialism is versus communism or Marxism or democratic socialism. But as was once said by Lenin, communism is the goal of socialism. So they're all the interconnected in the same thing. So when we're talking about Marxism, we're talking about what's in the Communist Manifesto, what Karl Marx based his life and philosophy off of, and just talking about those ideas in general. And point 10 of his 10-point plan in the Communist Manifesto calls for free public education for all students. So that's a point taken from that. And also it should be noted in the Communist Manifesto, it says that the nuclear family should be abolished as well. So looking at those two things together, we can also think about how Marx in his time was against the family and against parents and children. Marx and his ideology, Marx and Engels, and Marxists, you know, going back through history, thought that parents and children should have sort of a separation, that children should be parented more by the state or by the education system. And we've seen patterns of this throughout history in different communist countries where people have taken action to make sure that kids were separated from their parents, whether they were going to school, learning more communist ideologies and reporting their parents, um, if they weren't aligning with those things, or just other things like that. So throughout yeah. history, we've kind of seen these bigger patterns. Yeah, and it's really important to nail this down because without just throwing it into the wind, people are uh, exposing this ideology even today, as we've said. And so you can't just say, uh, well, most of Americans don't believe in that stuff. Most Americans still mm -hmm. want to have their children uh, be, pro be not, not property of their own, but live with them and, and raise them mm -hmm. with their own worldview. And so to... Uh, to a lot of people just are like, no, this is nonsense. It's uh, kind of radical stuff that it not doesn't have uh, importance in the public square. But no, we see it time and time come up again. Yeah. And what's interesting, too, is in America, socialism is a mainstream part of political debate now. There are mm. candidates that are openly calling themselves socialists. And there are professors in universities that openly call themselves Marxists. So it is a really real thing to discuss here, even if it's on a different level um, and looking at the patterns through history is so important to recognize and see these patterns if they're happening so that we can avoid history from repeating itself. Yeah, it's really true. And it's a good point to bring up that, okay, so you have different uh, almost stages of, of Marxism. But in today, I think a lot of either scholars or, or those on the left throw out what is Marxism and say, no, no, we own and uh, we want to push or advocate for what is socialism or, or democratic socialism. And so to that stance, I think it's... A, an interesting kind of thought exercise to push yourself through. And I, I think a lot of people in our generation have this uh, mindset that life is not black and white and that there's a lot of gray in, in between. And so how do you view these uh, individuals who, oh, okay, and we get them on camera, they'll say Marxism is horrible, it, it did horrible things in history, uh, it's, it's claimed a ton of lives, millions of lives. But no, what, what we are spouting and believe in is good, But even though it's a kind of a... a hmm. Uh, alliteration or, or a bit of Marxism. Yeah, saying that thought. it's not the same thing here if mm -hmm. we did it here and it would work here, even though it hasn't worked anywhere else, essentially. Yeah, and, and just furthering that point of, okay, so you have that mindset of 
and I think it's good to have that mindset too. It's helpful in life to understand that things aren't always uh, black and white. But this is where when you, when you are looking at Marxism and its effects on society and what it's done in the past, uh, as a Christian, I'm looking at this and I'm saying, okay, well, reality does inform me that mm-hmm. there is some black and white in life. Yeah. And that black and white uh, comes into existence of, of good and evil and God and the devil. And so Kangor has a, has a good book and a good running series, uh, Dr. Paul Kangor of uh, Karl Marx and the Devil. Mm-hmm. And, he, and he writes on this whole topic because Karl Marx touches on so many dark elements that it, it is black and white. Most people look at it and say, okay, that is, that is inherently evil or that is wrong. And I, I don't mean to uh, push aside how hard that distinction is sometimes, trying to decide, okay, is this, good or, is this the right decision right now? Because that decision can be one of the hardest ones ever, where you don't know what is right or wrong. Uh, but I think that is a minority of your time in life, and the majority of the time it's, it's almost clear and rational to see what is good and evil. Yeah. No, it's true. And especially what you're saying about the devil and Karl Marx from Paul Kengor, it's that book raises a lot of really good points and it breaks down Marx and his life and how religion played in that. And mm. Marx is against God. He openly says that. So as a Christian looking at Marxism, the two religion, Christianity and Marxism are clearly incompatible. Marx himself said this throughout his life. And today we do see Christians that think, oh, well, you know, socialism sounds like a good idea. It's Mm -hmm. a nice thing. We as Christians should be socialist Christians. But the entire ideology is in contrast and doesn't work. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about this influencing uh, kind of American society and specifically the education system, in my mind, we see it in in two main areas. Uh, The first one is that that we have this weird balance or uh, we accept that, okay, the government is involved in education process. And it, whether it's the federal government or the state government, you have a centralized form of government uh, passing legislation and policies over that. So that, that's a weird influence that you see, whether, uh, however you believe that influence has come about, but between Marxism and what we have today. And then the second, in my opinion, what is most largely is what we've been seeing over the past 20 years or specifically the last kind of decade is that you see it influencing uh, like elementary schools and mm-hmm. you see middle schools and you see students who students who don't know how to do basic level algebra talking about uh, social theory and how that involves uh, gender or uh, racism and social structures in America and it's just hard to see how that how they can grasp that and then how that is the most important thing to be educating right now. Yeah, and it's really crazy how the woke ideology has taken over elementary schools. Not We're not even just talking universities anymore. I feel like for a long time, the conservative mm-hmm. movement was focused on universities and mm-hmm. the biases going on there. But we're seeing it down to the elementary level with sex education in kindergarten now in some states and woke other woke ideas, clear leftist indoctrination in these public schools. So with that going on, and parents are realizing this because a huge part of this too is that a lot of this is going on behind parents' backs. They're not seeing the curriculum and they're finding out these things. And then there have been even instances where parents have gone to school board meetings standing against those things saying, I don't want my six-year-olds taught about sex. Mm -hmm. And parents go to these school board meetings and they're shut down and the schools are still pushing forward and becoming even more extreme. Yeah, and this is always, like, really hard for me to think about because part of me doesn't blame these people for wanting it. And and my explanation behind that is, okay, everyone has a worldview. So often I think uh, Christians get painted as it's not a worldview, it's only a religion. But I think – I really think religion and worldview are often so synonymous, and, and a lot of people overlook that. So when, when they're uh, trying to influence policy and they're, they're bringing these uh, topics into the education process for elementary schools – I understand that, okay, they're just trying to push their worldview, however they wrap it. But then again, the other part of me is like, no, okay, that's still wrong. I'm going to try to push against this as much as I can. Um, but then it, you hate to see when you try to do that, or I say when we try to do that, we, it's just painted as, no, you're only trying to um, imp- impose your religion on the general welfare of, of Americans. Yeah, and I think the point is there's right and wrong and there's truth and then there's 
you know, not true. Mm. So with a singular truth, it's wrong to mm. do certain things. And especially in a school setting, certain things are inappropriate for young kids. And that's pretty objective. It's not, I don't think there's much room for discussion on certain things, even though, yes, you're right. But I think, especially with these younger kids, most Americans don't agree with a lot of these explicit things going to young mm. kids, even teaching young kids about masturbation in schools. That's just not necessary, and especially at those young ages. So certain things like that, I think a lot of people are opening their eyes to and saying, okay, this is a bit much. Why is this happening? And I would ask the question too, why is it so important that these types of things be taught at such a young age in public schools? Mm. And your question you pose at the end, I think that's so important as uh, Christian conservatives to keep on asking the questions. And because so often, as I just mentioned, that when we try to uh, impose what we kind of want within our political structure, you get cast aside as uh, not not adhering to separation of, of state and church. But so often, maybe the better discourse is to keep on asking these uh, smart questions of, okay, we'll get to the bottom of the root. Like, whether you believe it's right or wrong, why do you want it? What is your motivation behind mm -hmm. uh, teaching these elementary students or middle school students about these topics? Yeah, and I think it's very blatantly can't be a good motive because I think that they are trying to confuse a lot of these young kids because part of the thing they're bringing into the classroom is all of this gender ideology and sexuality type lessons. So teaching a young kid that they can, for example, change their gender in elementary school and in certain schools, I believe in Chicago, um, but if you look up, you can see different cases of this. The, in public schools, teachers weren't required to tell parents if a kid wanted to either start to transition, look into that, change pronouns. So mm -hmm. why are schools and educators stepping into the role of parents and trying to teach kids, oh, well, are you sure that you're really a boy because you could be this or this and glorifying that to young kids who, quite frankly, don't know any better yet. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm pretty sure the example you bring up is in Matt Walsh's How okay, to, yeah. um, What is a Woman. And then for anyone else listening, just look up New, New Jersey laws, uh, Wisconsin, California, or New York. And there, I'm sure there's a number of other uh, laws or policies that have gone into effect, but we just have a few of those where uh, Grace found one where it's just um, teaching about genitalia or the vulva in elementary school. And it it's puts in perspective of, of, okay, what is important now? And then back to asking those important questions, what is important for these our students and uh, younger generations to be learning? And will these solve um, the problems that those on the left are saying are the problems and this is why they're teaching it? Yeah, and I would say absolutely not. Yeah. <laughs> and um, another one of those articles from the Daily Caller reads, New Jersey to punish schools that don't teach 10-year-olds about gender identity. So, again, it's at a young age, and it's being enforced more and more as we go on. And uh, there, I think there's clearly an attack on our younger generation with this, and it's something really serious that I think especially as Christians we should look at. But it's not even, it doesn't even have to be defined as a religious issue. I think it's mm. a pretty blatant, there's right and there's wrong, and certain things are inappropriate for young kids. Yeah, I agree. And then going back to the motivation part, is like, okay, let, okay, New Jersey, like, let every school teach about gender ideology. How does that solve the tenets of maybe critical race theory that say, oh, this is um, being imposed to solve inequalities in America, to fix uh, social power issues or structural power issues. And it, it, there's no clear line between uh, the policies that they're implementing to so wide social change to the ones that they're claiming that they want. Yeah, and I think that's why a lot of this, a lot of these different things happening are kind of crazy um, on their own, but looking at these cultural trends altogether, I think it really does tie back to cultural Marxism of trying to, you know, y we can look at the sexual revolution, the cultural revolution, the different things that happened there, where Marxists understand that, you know, pushing socialism or Marxism as a government system is not just an economic thing. Mm -hmm. It's a cultural battle, battle where you have to win the culture, basically. And I think that they're doing this through the education system, through Hollywood, and through a lot of other things. Even looking at the way that TV shows and movies are for younger kids now, they're getting more and more inappropriate for younger ages. So younger kids are seeing a lot mm. of things that they didn't used to be able to. Yeah, no, 
definitely true. And the best part of that that I think you had spot on is that Marx was a theorist. And mm-hmm. so he's trying to understand in all of his works um, what drives humanity, what is what are our wants and needs, and uh, just studying us and studying mm-hmm. why what he thinks will work in a system. And so you're 100% correct is that he understood that cultural is a driving force in any society or culture is a driving force. And so how does how do you influence that uh, as the main point to get your government that he eventually wanted? Yeah, exactly. And Marxists also understand that they can't get the revolution that they want without influencing the culture too. Because you yeah. have to, to take in control of people, they're wanting to take away the family and take away people's meaning almost with religion. And they want to kind of usher in more of these things, which wasn't... Well, Usher in a grand utopia that, that will yeah. be much better and fitting to our needs and wants. Exactly, which clearly hasn't worked ever throughout history. But also another interesting thing. So I was in D.C. a few weeks ago, and I heard um, a woman speak named Shi Van Fleet, and she lived through Mao's cultural revolution in China. She was mm. in first grade when that started, which is super interesting, I think, because she spoke and she was just talking about how in first grade when the cultural revolution started there, the schools got shut down for, I believe it was either a year or two years. Mm -hmm. And what was interesting is when she went back to school after that, they basically put life and education on pause. She went back to school and all of the textbooks had changed. They'd become, you know, what was, they'd become supportive of communism and that type of thing. So basically the government went in and put only things they approved of in schools. And I think that's just, again, another important historical thing to just be Mm -hmm. aware of whoa, this this has happened before. Um, and obviously America's not doing that at that scale, but it's just very interesting to think about. And she said that she sees a lot of patterns here um, and smaller patterns and different things that are mm-hmm. starting to happen in our school systems. Well, that's super interesting. And not to go off too topic, but what do you remember any of the specific examples that were in those textbooks that changed after I'm not the sure, yeah. She didn't mm-hmm. go into super that much specifics but I think it was I think actually one example was they had the little red book Mm, um, Mao so that was a focus of what became taught in the school so basically anything that was propping up the communist regime and anything else was taken out and that's again where you have kids that are trained to report their parents if they say anything against the government Mm -hmm. Um, so a lot of that stuff it's crazy yeah I think it's super fascinating because no matter where uh, Marxist ideology kind of influences in the world it, it takes root and influ- or takes root and then it manifests in different ways so i specifically in china i think maybe it manifest uh i mean just hypothetically maybe uh towards physical learning and less kind of gender mm-hmm. ideology and sexual revolution base but then you see it in america where you have uh this freedom of thought and in a democracy mm-hmm. that so it's really cool seeing okay now we have authoritative state and how that takes root but now in a democracy how the cultural is so much more important to uh, influencing and ultimately getting kind of a Marxist utopia. Yeah, exactly. And I think one of the reasons we wanted to touch on some of these more historical things, too, and things that have happened in other places um, under communists throughout the years is because the school system's barely teaching that um, in mass. It is in some places, but Mm. for the most part, the school system, the public schools are not teaching young people about the realities of socialism and communism. And I think that that's a big factor in why so many young people think that socialism or communism is a good idea, because there is a pretty big block of young people that think that that ideology is good. And I think the reason is because they don't truly know what it is or Mm. understand what it would mean, which has been proven. I mean, even in certain interviews and surveys, a lot of the people that say that they would approve of a socialist being elected to some Mm. position in America can actually define socialism. So there's a lot to look at there where there's definitely a a disconnect between how much people really understand about the history and other places with some ideas that are coming here that have been tried other places and what it would mean here. I think you're right, and I think that is underlining uh, fundamentally why it's so hard to engage on these yeah. topics. And so, when you talk to someone who is 23, and we're all in like maybe a grassroots organization, mm-hmm. a lot of the times that they're motivated purely by maybe good intentions, and I say most of the time, majority yeah. of the time. And then you you look at the leaders, and time and time and again throughout history, maybe not right, might not, not right now, you can't point out specific examples. But throughout history, you can see where the leaders of either socialistic movements 
or uh, Marxist movements have failed the uh, general ideology of maybe what their uh, net networks or grassroots are exposing, and they take um, uh, personal interest and they and they manipulate the whole situation. They yeah. steal from their grassroots organizations. Yeah, and even as you were saying, a lot of people are good intentioned, which politicians take advantage of and oh, manipulate. Yeah. That's mm. the thing, because a lot of these people that think that socialism or Marxism is a good idea just want the best. They just think, mm. oh, well, it would be great if we were all equal and we all had the same tax, whatever it may be. It would be great if the rich would just pay their fair share and mm. help the rest of us along so that no one would be poor. But that's just not how it works. That's not the reality. And Marxism in practice has failed every time and especially would here. So a lot of people do have good intentions, but just, I think, don't know. And it's not their fault. The school system has done a huge disservice, I think, to people um, and to young people, hasn't taught, you know, a lot of those economic and historical and ideological realities. Mm -hmm. and, and when we talk about specifically in schools now, mm -hmm. we talk about critical race theory being that kind of moving block of uh, most of the people maybe maybe don't know the actual theory and uh, scholarly work behind it and don't maybe spend the time reading these journal articles. But they see on any media outlet and they understand that, okay, maybe some of the uh, main thought processes of CRT are that, yeah, we want to abolish inequalities, uh, equality for everybody, so then, and then also uh, take down a, a racist um, social justice system. Right, and so you have that, and they see that, and they're like, "Yeah, how can you be against that?" Yeah, and, and then at for face those, value, you, that's you true. Can't. For those listening, if people don't know, CRT, critical race theory, is being taught in a, in most public universities now, most public schools, um, and has been a huge topic, basically, and of controversy. But yeah, you're mm -hmm. you're right, though. And from even a number here, um, this is from William Tierney, and he's a leading uh, CRT scholar, and he says, CRT is an attempt to understand the oppressive aspects of society in order to generate societal and individual transformation. And it's like, yeah, face value, that's great, but then how do you plan on doing that? And so much of this uh, scholarly work dives into, no, you need to drastically change the social order, and then when you look at their solutions, it ties so closely to some of the works that Marx has done. Yeah, absolutely, and I think... I think it's important to look at the roots of CRT, where it came from, what it really means, and what its founders wanted for it. And I think that, yeah, there are a lot of maybe scholars now that have good intentions and want equality, but I think it's important to look at the roots of it really didn't have anything to do with that. It was So CRT was founded mm -hmm. um, from critical theory, which started at a Frankfurt school in Germany in the 1920s, which was a Marxist institution um, that was formed. So this was a Marxist institution, Frankfurt School, that formed critical theory, and then from that came critical race theory. And it's really where cultural Marxism started. So then those people in Frankfurt took that over to Columbia University in New York, and that's where that kind of started here. And the person in charge of or that was helping found the American public school system played a big role in ushering those people in. So those are all big name Marxists that came over and started this and CRT formed from there. And I think looking at those roots, this is a Marxist ideology, mm. CRT, and it really at its root is that. It's not just some surface level, oh, well, it's equality. It's not. It's a Marxist ideology that is kind of being ushered in as a Trojan horse, I would say, to where people are saying, well, it's just for equality, but it's a lot deeper than that. And its goal is to tear apart the Western institutions that, you know, have been supported by Judeo-Christian values mm -hmm. and to kind of break down those institutions. And even with race, using race to kind of, you know, s differentiate people and split people up and say, well, if you're black, then you're oppressed. And if you're white, then you have something to apologize for and just the different practices that it has. Okay, now I kind of want let's apply this to the political system in the U.S. Mm -hmm. And from our conservative stances, how do we move forward with this? Do we engage in this uh, debates about what critical race theory is uh, proposing to fix? Do we kind of evade it and move away and focus on our own uh, traditional conservative values? And in my, my mindset, the, it's a hard answer, but you need to have some balance where you keep on with conservative tenets, but then 
some of those conservative tenants also match and align with, okay, we, we will help the poor. And so when that, when we will help the poor in whatever ways we can, starting at uh, subsidiary uh, at the lowest level and working up, I think that can solve some of the issues that critical race theory says it wants to aim, or, yeah. uh, solve in issues of like social inequalities. Yeah, and I think part of the problem is that, yeah, with inequality, both sides, conservatism, conservatives, mm. liberals alike, everyone wants equality. And we believe, as we talked about in the last episode, all people are created <laughs> in the image of God. All life is sacred and, you know, all people are equal in the and created in the image of God. So there's no question about that. So I do think we have to be careful to not um, affirm if they're trying to say that the other side mm. uh, doesn't think that we should have equality because that's just not true. Mm. Everyone wants equality. I just think that their motives aren't actually that. I think their motives are deeper than that and have more to do with kind of breaking apart these institutions and making these cultural changes that we've been talking about for the episode where I think we do have to look at what is actually happening, what they're actually teaching. But yeah, it's very true that a lot of people don't want to define what CRT is. And a lot of the people that are CRT scholars don't even want to exactly define what it is, which, or outline in a curriculum what it would mean, because I think they're, I think they are hiding things, but. I agree. There's a couple clips, um, uh, I think they've gone pretty viral, just like people on NBC, and it's you have these legal scholars, uh, CRT scholars, who go on and, and mm -hmm. they give maybe a couple sentences about what it wants to do, what uh, CRT aims to do, and then they are asked if if this is uh, able for for anyone in like a college level or high school level to understand, and then time and time they go, no, 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 this is like for the highest level of academics, uh, you need to be a doctor to understand this stuff, even professors kind of mess up what it is. And I, I, just, I think it's such a bold-faced lie to the public. Yeah, it is. And, yeah, and, you know, what? it's just a huge topic that I know that we're going to probably try to talk more about because all the things we talked about today are really big topics that it's hard to cover in, you know, such a short time and such a short segment. But we encourage you to look into these things, look into these topics. And we have plenty of nice books here that we'd recommend. Mm. Um, for those listening, we have some books by Paul Kengor, um, Mark Levin, we have The Road to Serfdom. So, yeah, definitely, um, you know, keep reading up on these topics because they're important and not going away. But just before we Absolutely. close, we want to say a big congratulations <laughs> to Aaron, who just got engaged this weekend. Thank you, Grace. Yeah, so Didn't we're really excited coming. about that. But any closing thoughts, Appreciate Aaron? Appreciate that. Well, uh, fun time and uh, a fun season of life right now. But thank you for tuning in to Liberty Mail with us. We're excited to keep on moving and, and hitting on these fun yeah. and hard topics sometimes. Absolutely. So, yeah, thanks for listening to Liberty Mail by the <laughs> Institute for Faith and Freedom. Make sure that you like, comment, and subscribe, and we will see you next week. For more information on the Institute for Faith and Freedom, visit faithandfreedom.com.